All the Young Dudes by Miss King Bain 89, Chapter 12, First Year, Christmas 1971. Lupin, perhaps you can tell me, what are the transfigurative properties of Laffer's Philosophorum? McGonagall called out towards the end of the lesson one day. She gave him a very pointed look. The last time she'd ask him a question in front of the class, he then shrugged and looked away. Um, Ramus racked his brain. Well, I think that's the one that turns stuff into gold. He used it right, and Cleopatra the alchemist used it to turn lead into silver, I think. Correct. McGonagall sounded as if she was trying to mask her surprise. Five points to Gryffindor, and another five for making the connection to Cleopatra the alchemist. She's not mentioned in Transfiguration for Beginners. Did you read that in your history text? Remus nodded, aware that everyone was looking at him. Well... Excellent. Some of my third year students are incapable of cross referencing their studies like that. I'm pleased to see you taking such an interest, she addressed the class. And we will begin discussing alchemy after Christmas. Which reminds me, with the holidays approaching, I'd like to ask any students planning to remain at Hogwarts over the break to let me know by the end of the week. Thank you, you're dismissed. The class stood up to leave. A few people patted Remus on the back as they passed. Mr. Lupin, if you have a moment, McGonagall said just as he was passing her desk. His stomach dropped. He'd gone two weeks without any attention from her. He should have known something was coming. He stood still, shoving his hands deep in his pockets and staring at his feet as the rest of the class filled it out. Finally, the classroom empty, she walked over and shut the door right in James's face and turned back into the room. Well done today, Remus, McGonagall said kindly. You've been doing really well lately. He looked up at her, startled. She laughed. Don't look so surprised. I'm very impressed. Professor Slughorn and Professor Flitwick had said the same. I want a quick word with you about Christmas. I've spoken with Mrs Orwell. Who? The lady who runs St Edmunds. Oh, oh, right, matron. Quite. As you know, the full moon will occur twice in December. The second, that was next week, and the 31st, New Year's Eve. Mrs. Orwell seems to be in the opinion that you would be better off remaining at Hogwarts over Christmas for this reason. I hope you aren't too disappointed, Remus shrugged. I'm not fussed either way, Professor McGonagall nodded very seriously. I shall add your name to the list then. I shall see you next week, Remus. James invited Sirius and Remus to visit him over the break, knowing that neither of them were facing a particularly merry Christmas otherwise. Remus was forced to decline. Even if he hadn't been incredibly shy about visiting James's home and meeting his parents, he was still legally in the care of St Edmund's local authority and needed written permission from the matron to leave Hogwarts. Sirius, who would have loved the opportunity to spend two weeks mucking about with James, racing their brooms and eating chocolate, also had to refuse. His family had made it quite clear that they did not approve of him visiting the Potter family under any circumstances. Bellatrix, that bitch has been feeding my parents' information, he explained darkly. Apparently, I've disgraced them enough already. If I go to yours, then it'll only get worse. Sorry, mate. Remus went to the edge of the grounds with the marauders all to wave them off on the last day of the term. We'll send you owls, James promised. See if you can come up with our next plan to attack Snape. Remus grinned and promised he would try. He hoped that the letters James sent would not be too long. It was the only Gryffindor first year staying back behind the grape, and trudged on a lonely path back up to the castle. The next day, he enjoyed ironing, something they were never allowed to do at St. Edmunds. He slept until ten o'clock when Frank Longbottom poked his head round the door. Come on, Lupin, you'll miss breakfast at this rate. Remus really liked Frank. He had a broad, friendly face and an easy-going manner. He seemed altogether solid and dependable, like an older brother. He understood that Remus was used to being an outsider and tried to include him wherever possible without pushing him too hard. After breakfast, Frank disappeared to the owlery and Remus sat glumly in the common room, feeling the next two weeks stretch before him, empty and lonely. He considered a walk around the grounds, but it had started to rain heavily. He played a few of Sirius's records and flipped through a stack of magazines some four years he left behind, just looking at the pictures. They were mostly of pretty glamorous wishes and handsome wizards. He supposed it was a fashion mag. The next few days passed in much the same way. Frank would get him up in the morning. He'd eat all his meals with the remaining Gryffindors in the Great Hall, but otherwise he was left to his own devices. 
He was so bored at one point, he even thought about doing some of the homework he'd been set. He'd been trying to improve his own writing, but it was almost impossible with the ridiculous feather quills they were provided. No one would ever answer him properly when he asked why they couldn't just use bureaus. Even a pencil might have been better. He actually did try to read for a while, but after attempting a paragraph from his biology text, he gave up in frustration. He copied out a few of the diagrams instead. Remus didn't mind drawing, he liked the freedom of it. Every day, he walked around that castle a few hours with his map. The other boys had long since discarded theirs, having learnt all the classroom locations after the first week or so. But Raymond had gone to his, still bothered by its incompleteness. He'd begun marking it up himself, adding points of interest, hiding places in the secret passages where he found. The rest of the time he spent avoiding teachers who were concerned about his being alone. He wasn't the only student left in the school, but most of the others were six and seventh years, who generally stayed in the library advising art for exams or working on their coursework. Slughorn was holding his special extra potions classes in the dungeons, but Remus hadn't been invited and probably wouldn't have gone anyway. He practised a few spells and entertained himself for a good few hours trying to see how many objects in their dorm he could levitate at once. He made a game of it, throwing various objects, books, gobstones, decks of cards, up in the air and trying to stop them before they hit the ground. He had to stop that eventually when Frank knocked on the door and told him irritably to keep the noise down. Saturday, 24th December, 1971. On Christmas Eve, Remus was woken earlier than usual. It was still quite dark. Heavy rain pelted the thick glass window panes. It sounded a bit loud enough to echo through the empty dorm, but that wasn't what had disturbed him. The door was creaking open and someone had stepped inside. Sitting up and peering through the groom, Remus had expected to see Longbottom telling him to get up for breakfast. But it wasn't Frank. It was a very soggy and dishevelled looking boy with long hair and a haughty face. Sirius! Remus leapt out of bed, overjoyed to see his friend. Sirius pushed his wet hair out of his eyes. He'd clearly been out in the rain. He pulled off his heavy travelling cloak, dropped it in a pile on the floor. All right, Lupin? He grinned. Freezing, innit? He pointed his wand at the fireplace. Incendio. What are you doing here? That's enough, he said simply, pulling off his boots, which were caked in mud. Got into an argument with Dad, then the whole family got into it. All the usual stuff. Call me a blood traitor, shame of the family, etc, etc. He flopped down on his bed. So I left. Wow. Remus rubbed his eyes, wall struck. How'd you get here? Blue powder. Sirius shrugged. Two pub in the village, then just walked up. Wow. Remus repeated. I'm starving, they sent me to bed last night without dinner. Come on, get dressed, breakfast. And the Gunnacle was not as pleased to see Sirius as Remus was. The two boys attempted to take their seats at the table as if nothing was out of the ordinary, but she appeared at the side almost immediately. Mr. Black, she said, a note of warning in a voice which Remus recognised from his detentions. What is the meaning of this? I missed you too, Professor. He grinned up at her. The corner of the old witch's mouth twitched, but she kept her composure. You were seen walking onto the grounds from Oxmade at six o'clock this morning. Do you care to explain yourself further? Sirius shook his head. Not really, Professor. There's pretty much all there is to it. I gotta go side, shaking her head lightly. She had the same look of pity she usually reserved for Remus. Very well, Mr. Black. I shall have to contact your parents, of course, so they know where they are. No need, Sirius replied, nodding at the flock of owls which had just swooped into the room. The largest of the birds, a huge stately eagle owl, dropped a thick red envelope into Sirius's plate. He looked down at it and then up at McGonagall with a wry smile. I think they know exactly where I am. He picked up the ominous envelope and without breaking eye contact with McGonagall, ripped it open. Almost immediately, the letter began to shriek. The voice was so loud that it filled up the entire hall, causing Ed's to turn. McGonagall winced at the ear-splitting pitch of it. It was the voice of Sirius's mother. Sirius O'Ryan Black, it screeched. How dare you defy your father in this matter? Remus covered his ears. Sirius remained perfectly still, looking up at McGonagall. Consorting with half-breeds and blood traitors, turning your back on your family. If your grandfather was alive, he'd have you disowned the moment you were sorted. You will remain at school until the end of the year, and you can think about the shame and dishonour you've brought your noble title. Don't think we won't disinherit you. You are not 
our only son. With that, the leather burst into flames, curling and shriveling into a pile of chalk white ash. The silence that followed was deafening. Everyone was staring. Sirius reached for some toast, put her on his plate, and then began ladling scrambled egg to it nonchalantly. He glanced up at McGonagall again. You can send Mother an owl if you like, Professor, but I doubt she'll read it. Very well, Sirius, McGonagall nodded. Just try to keep out of trouble, will you? With that, she walked stiffly back to the teacher's table at the far end of the hall. Sirius ate his breakfast in silence. Years later, Remus would always remember thinking in that moment that Sirius Black must be the bravest boy in the world. Christmas Day at St. Edmund's was usually an extremely noisy affair. Some boys got presents delivered, those with distant relatives who cared enough to send new sweatshirt perhaps, but not enough to visit. Others may do with the usual selection of donations from the locals, which Matron had wrapped up for them. Gift getting was quickly followed by gift swapping. They often passed the morning bartering and trading the meagre items they received. They were made to smarten themselves up, then led in a long line down to the church, where they would sit through the Christmas service, bored and slouching. Christmas morning at Hogwarts was a good deal more pleasant. Remus was almost touched to find that Matron had not forgotten him. The post had arrived overnight, and at the end of his bed he found a card from her, as well as a lumpy package which contained a bag of nuts, an orange, and a tin of biscuits. To his amazement, James had also sent a present, his very own set of gobstones. Peter had even sent a box of chocolate frogs. Merry Christmas, Sirius yawned, opening his own gifts. He had nothing from his parents, as far as Remus would see, but he didn't mention it. James had sent him an annual of his favourite Quidditch team, the South and Scorchers, and he had a box of frogs from Peter too. Merry Christmas, Remus returned. I didn't get anyone presents, he admitted guiltily. I didn't know if they would. Don't worry about it, Sirius polite on his way to the bathroom. No one expected you to. This troubled Remus, but he tried not to think about it. While Sirius was in the loo, another owl flew in the window and dropped the large, flat, square package on his bed. When Sirius came out and saw it, his eyes lit up and he ripped it open eagerly. It's from Andromeda, he exclaimed, pulling the record out and showing it to Remus who hurried over excitedly. It was another muggle album. The cover was black, printed with the silhouetted image of a man standing in front of a huge amplifier playing a guitar. He had long, wild, curly hair, stood out with his legs apart in a power stance, outlined in gold. Electric Warrior, the title blared. T-Rex. Oh, T-Rex, I think I've heard of him, Remus said as Sirius flipped it over to read the track listening. Stick it on, Remus encouraged impatiently. Who cared what the cover said? Sirius did, sliding that out of the slick back disc and setting it on his turntable. The record began to turn and the room filled with music, a smooth sliding frog. entranced, stopping only to flip to the B-side. Once it was over, Sirius wordlessly turned it over and began at the beginning again. They alternated between sitting on the bed, swaying slightly to the melody, or nodding their heads as the beats quickened. They shared grins with each other at the catchiest riffs, and lay down to stare at the ceiling for the slower, dreamier tracks. Eventually, halfway through the second listen, Frank came in. Merry Christmas, lads. Come on, breakfast. They dressed quickly and went on to the dining hall. The great hall had been decorated garishly by the teachers. Glittering ropes of tinsel, red and green gold sparkled from every rafter, hanging down like festive jungle vines. Twelve enormous trees twinkled with lights in every colour imaginable, and the bubbles the size of footballs hanged from each branch. After breakfast, the boys ran back upstairs to listen to the album again. It's the coolest thing I've ever heard, Remus declared. Sirius nodded solemnly. Sirius's favourite song was Jeepster. He loved the twanging chords and the aggressive thump of it. Remus liked Monolith the best. It was spacey and smooth, the words both nonsensical and meaningful at the same time. It made him feel like he was floating. The rest of the day, they played music in the common room, ate their way through the chocolate frogs, nuts and biscuits, and played rowdy games of exploding snap. Meals at Ogles were always spectacular, Christmas dinner was no different, but 
the time night had fallen. Room had eaten so much he thought he might never be hungry again. Though he didn't say it to Sirius, who, after all, had been forced to run away from home for the first, if not the last time. It was Remus's best Christmas ever.